Well, uh, let's get started. Welcome to lecture one of the course, uh, which is about market clearing as an optimization problem. Uh, it could be any market, electricity market, gas market, heat market, or whatever. The basis is the same, but here our, our focus will be electricity market. Good. Let's uh, start with uh, a simple example. And uh, your answers are, are more than welcome. You can, you can write your answers in the, in the chat box. Let's assume that we have a single hour, no network. We have a single generator, G1, whose capacity is 100 megawatt and whose offer price is $12 per megawatt hour. And also assume we have only one demand, demand D1, whose elastic to price, uh, the maximum load of this demand is 80 megawatt. And the bid price of this demand is $40 per megawatt hour. Okay, it's a, it's a very simple market and we like to clear it manually without writing an optimization problem. So the question is that what the market outcomes will be in terms of production level of generator G1, consumption level of D1, and most importantly, the market clearing price. Let's just start with the production level. How much it will be? It's a simple question, right? Maybe you can write a few numbers in the chat box. Drake, maybe you can write in the chat box. Okay, I have a lot of 80. Yes, it will be 80. That's, that's correct. Good, 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 good. And uh, similarly, the consumption level of demand will be 80. Good. So what about the price? What do you think about the price? If we go for uniform pricing, not other type of pricing schemes, uniform pricing means that we have a single price for the whole system, assuming that there is no network. So what will be the market price? And there is no power losses. Let's say there is, it's, it's a DC power flow. We have a lot of answers. Some say it's 40, some say it's between 12 to 40, but mostly they are saying 40. Okay. Ah, we have also 12. <laughs> So we have three options, 12, 40, any price between 12 and 40. Okay, maybe someone saying 12, maybe you can unmute and say why he or she thinks the price will be 12. Or someone who is supporting the result is, the, I mean, the, the option of $40 per megawatt hour. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so my reasoning was that because- uh, First, what's uh, your answer? 12. 12, okay. So my reasoning was that because the demand is uh, basically fully dispatched, uh, basically mm -hmm. it's getting all the demand that it needs, then um, the price will be set by the generator because it's not fully dispatched. Okay. Good, thank you. So the reasoning here is that uh, if instead of 80, we will go for 81, and still, still the extra demand will be supplied by G1, whose offer price is 12. So this is the reasoning why uh, uh, it said the price will be 12. Uh, marginal price. I would say marginal generation cost is 12, I agree. Uh, but I'm not saying the price is 12. Uh, let's see if there is any explanation for those who are saying the price is 40. Any input? You are welcome to unmute and discuss. Okay. What about those who are saying the price is something between 12 and 40? You are welcome to unmute and, and explain. 
well, we just haven't defined what the market clearing mechanism is yet. So it can be anything in that range. Uh, it's, it's uniform price. No, but again, we haven't decided how we're clearing the market. Is it a double-sided auction? Okay. Um, and in a double-sided auction, some edge case like this always has a specific definition. Does it default to the maximum, the minimum, the mean? Very good. Um, okay, if we don't have any, uh, how to say, regulation, as you said, what it will be in general? Are you, are you saying 40 or between 12 and 40? I'm saying between 12 and 40. Um, okay. It really depends on how we how we define it. Very good, very good, very good, very good. Uh, Mahir is saying 40. Would you like to, to discuss? Market cannot be cleared. No, market can be cleared. There's no problem. Why not? Uh, there is a generator who is willing to, to sell at the price of 12 a demand who is willing to buy at a higher price. So market can be definitely cleared. So the question is about the price. Okay, let me explain. Good, good. Um, yeah, uh, one of you said very nicely. Uh, well, uh, there is a common saying that the price is the cost of generating. Huh, I, I'm not sure I agree. The price is the marginal price of generation and also the demand utility both. Exactly, it depends about on, on, on merit order on supply and demand curve. Okay, let, let me explain. But, but you know exactly if we have, uh, let's say here is the price, here is the quantity, uh, quantity. So we have a supply and demand curve. So this is a demand curve, this is a supply curve. And if there is intersection, that intersection gives the price. So here will be the price. But here the problem is that there is no intersection because here it looks like this. So the demand is going for 80 megawatt at price 40, while the generation curve is something like this, up to 100, and uh, the offer price is 12. So yes, it's clear that we are clearing at 80 megawatt, but it's not very clear what the price will be. You agree, right? So here, uh, no, we assume that here we go for uniform pricing. If it's pay as bid, it's clear. So everyone is paid or pays based on what uh, he or she bids or offer. So if it's pay as bid, it's easy, but we are talking about uniform pricing. We are going to get one single price for the whole system. So in here, in this case, Yeah, let, 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 let me now explain. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of <laughs> answers. It's really nice that you are, uh, you are very active. Thank, thank you so much for being active. Uh, yes, so if we uh, uh, go for not 80, but 81, right? Uh, so so this, yeah, it's one of you explain about social welfare. I'll, I'll talk about social welfare right, later. But, but here, if we go for 81, it means that uh, the, the, the extra generation cost will be 12. But on the other hand, yeah, we will talk about social welfare later. On the other hand, if we go for 81, then the, the social welfare will increase by 40 megawatt. So in this specific case, the price is, is any price between 12 and 40 including those numbers. So it, it's, it, the price is between 12 and 40. So here we say we have price multiplicity. So if you would like to, to uh, get a price, the price manually, if it's easy, then you can say, okay, I increase uh, uh, the, the demand by one megawatt and I see what happens. And then you can say, I decrease the demand by one megawatt and see what happens. But, the, but in this case, um, 
uh, we need to have specific regulation about the market. Here, without any regulation about pricing, we have a price multiplicity. Anything between 12 and 40 could be a price because we don't have intersection. Anyway, so this is the answer. So we have price multiplicity here and different markets all over the world, they, have, they may have different regulations or rules, what to do if there are a range of potential prices. Because at any price between 12 and 40, both demand and generator, they are happy. Okay, let's uh, extend a little our, our example. Now assume that we have two thermal generators and two demands. Um, what do you think now? What are the production, cost, production level of G1 and G2 and consumption of D1 and D2? Maybe you can write your answers in the, in the chat box. Yes. Thank you, Raquel. Exactly. So here, yes, exactly. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Sahant. Yes, exactly. The total demand is 150 and the total install capacity is 180. So we can't fully supply the demand. There is no network. Exactly. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so first we will fully dispatch the cheaper, the cheaper generator, which is G1. So G1 will be 100 and the rest of the demand will be supplied by G2 who is, who is the expensive generator. So 100 by G1 and 50 by G2. And similarly, the demand, uh, both demands will be fully supplied because their bid prices are way higher than the offer price of generators. So again, it's 100 and, and, and 50. Very good. What about the price? So Achilles says that it will be between 20 and 35. The same answer came from Neuron and that's it. So I think we can uh, again agree because if we go for supply and demand curve, so the demand curve is 100 by D1 with the bid price of 40 and then additional 50. So here is 150 and the bid price is 35. And then uh, from the generation side, we have 100 by G1 at the bid offer price of 12 and then extra 80. So here is 180 at the price of, of 20. So again, this is our intersection. There is no intersection, but this is the quantity cleared. And again, here we have price multiplicity between 24 and 40. Good, any questions so far? Sorry, not 20, uh, sorry, it's wrong. 20 and 35, yeah. Okay, we will talk about how to drive um, the market price using optimization. But if you are asking question what to do if there is price multiplicity, I, I can share with you a couple of papers, what different markets they do in that condition. But how to drive the price, I'll explain uh, in the next uh, slides. Good. Yes, this is the answer. So the question is, now we, I, I have a new question for you. Um, you cleared the market by heart in the previous slide. But now we like to write an optimization problem for that and clear the market using an optimization problem. How can we do that? Any idea? So let me explain it myself. Exactly. 
we have uh, several answers. Uh, Akila says maximize social welfare, good. Uh, Mehdi says total demand is equal to total generation. Yeah, that's of course one of the constraints we need. Uh, Farizat said minimum total cost of production or ma maximize social welfare. Very good, I'll explain. Uh, Ramin said social welfare, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, we have a very good answer. Maximize social welfare subject to constraints, technical constraints and balance constraints. Very, very good, Nura. Yes, exactly. So in every market, uh, we need to maximize social welfare. Social welfare of, of the entire market. Uh, it's also known as market surplus. So uh, what does it mean? So it means that if we have a, 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 a demand curve and supply curve. So, so this is the, the demand surplus. This is the generation cost and the area between these two curves, it's social welfare. So this area is the social welfare, but how to write it, it's easy. It's the total utility of demands based on their bid prices minus total cost of generators based on their offer price. So we are always trying to maximize the social welfare. Okay. But before talking about the constraints of our optimization problem, let me ask a question. In our previous example, the demands, they were elastic to price, but if they are inelastic, it means that they, their bid prices are infinite. It means that at any price, they are willing to buy power. So then how can we reformulate the social welfare? Any idea? Thank you, Brian. So here, the demand and bid prices, they are fixed. It means that this part will be constant. So the constant term in the objective function can be eliminated. Then it will be maximizing minus total cost. So maximizing minus means minimizing, minimizing total cost. So if our demands became inelastic to price, then instead of maximizing social welfare, we just need to minimize the total system cost. Very good. About the constraints, uh, assume we don't have network at the moment. So we need to have two types of constraints one is all technical constraints for generators and demands. The technical constraint of generators means their install capacity, their P mean, if they have minimum production level, their ramping constraints. If we go for unit commitment, we will talk later. We need unit commitment constraints like minimum uptime, minimum downtime constraints, and, and, and et cetera. Also, we need power balance equality. It means that total demand is equal to total generation if there is no network. So if we uh, get back to our previous example with two generators and two demands, assuming that our demands are elastic to price, so demands D1 and D2. So first of all, we are maximizing. Please always write or list your variables under mean or max operator. It's really important. So here we have four variables the production level of G1, production level of G2, consumption level of D1 and consumption level of D2, right? Then we are maximizing social welfare, which is equal to the bid price of D1 times its product, sorry, its consumption variable, plus the bid price of generator, sorry, demand two times its consumption level. So this is the uh, uh, demand, the value of, of power for the demands minus the production cost, which is the offer price of generator one times its production level, and also the, the offer price of generator G2 times its uh, production level. So this is our social welfare. Then uh, we have five constraints. The demands D1 and D2, they are willing to consume D1 maximum up to 100 megawatt and D2 up to 50. G1 can produce 
uh, between zero and 100. 100 is its installed capacity and G2 up to 80. Then the total demand should be equal to total generation. It's power balance constraint. Okay. Any questions so far? Well, um, we, will, we will make the problem much more complex later, very soon. So this is the explanations I just provided. Set of primal variables, utility of demands, cost of generators, consumption limits, generation limits, and power balance. Why the demand is not more restricted? Um, Raquel, D1, um, the, the maximum load that D1 would like to consume is, is 100, right? Uh, in, in our example, we didn't provide any extra restriction. If you like, you can add extra uh, limitations if it's relevant. It's always covered. We don't need to have extra. Uh, so so uh, uh, the power balance constraint, it enforces that the, the old demand should be supplied as far as they are bidding at, at the proper price. Okay. Well, uh, let's talk about this problem from optimization perspective. Is this optimization problem convex? Priyanka says, yes, everyone. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, we have very, uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, you said yes, one of you said, because it's linear and since it's linear, it's convex. Yes, every, every linear problem is convex. Here, this problem is linear because our objective function is linear, our constraints are linear. There is no uh, bilinear term. It means the product of variables. There is no bilinear term. There is no nonlinear operator, like, I don't know, uh, sine function, cosine function, logarithm function. There is no nonlinear function. This problem is linear. Every linear problem is convex, okay? But assume that in general, in general, without knowing that this problem is convex, let's say we have a general problem like minimize f of x, the variable is x subject to h of x is equal to zero and g of x is lower than or equal to zero. How can we know that this problem is convex? Let's start with objective function. To make sure that our objective function is convex, what should we check? Hessian matrix, very good. Very good, very good, very good. Okay, you have a very good background, good. Uh, Ramin, Ahmad, uh, Prabhat, and Marin, yes, your, your answers are, correct, uh, are totally correct. We have to check the Hessian matrix of, uh, of the objective function. If it's semi-definite positive, then our objective function is convex. So, so quadratic objective function, depending on its Hessian matrix could be convex, as long as its Hessian matrix is semi-definite positive. Very good. Let's talk about Equality constraint. What type of equality constraint is convex? Or let me reward. Neuron says linear. Quadratic equality. I find, yes. Quadratic equality. Is it convex? If h of x is quadratic, then is the problem convex? No, exactly. For equality constraint, it should be linear, right? It should be affine or it should be linear. If we have quadratic term in H of X, then our problem is not, is not convex. So for example, in, in gas uh, flow or even in the power flow, we have quadratic equality. So that's the reason why it's done convex. So this is why we make it lower than or equal to zero. In other words, we make it, we, we relax it 
and then we make it in the form of conic or STP or whatever, and then we make it convex. Well, it's not the, uh, the content of this course, but just to get an idea how we can convexify the gas flow problem, heat flow problem, power flow problem even, if we have equality constraint in a quadratic form, we relax it to make it inequality, and then we make sure that it's in the form of conic program or semi-definite program. Well, whatever. G of x, to make the problem linear, to make sure that the problem linear, should G, G of x necessarily be linear or it, should be, it could be quadratic? What is your answer? So what is the condition for G of x lower than or equal to zero to be convex? Exactly. G of x lower than or equal to zero, it doesn't need to necessarily be linear. It could be quadratic. Just we have to make sure it's in the form of conic program or semi-definite program. It's not the part of this course, but just to get you, to give you an idea, G of x lower than or equal to zero, it could be quadratic while the whole problem is convex. Very good. Um, but as we discussed, this our market current problem is linear. It's simple, it's linear, so it's convex. Very good. Let's continue. Yeah. So in our optimization problem here, how can we, if we go for uniform pricing, how can we get the market clearing price? Any idea? How can we get the price here? Dual variable, exactly. Yes. Oh, good. A lot of answers. Yes, Adam. Get a dual of a balancing constraint. Uh, Achilles, Milat. Alessio, yes, dual variable. We need dual variable, but every single constraint can get a dual variable. Which dual variable? Or the dual variable of which constraint? The balancing constraint. The dual variable of balancing constraint gives us the market price. Exactly, the market price. Okay, now, uh, exactly. The dual variable of one F gives us the market clearing price. Good, okay, that's my next question, uh, Sebastian, I, I, I will explain. But before answering that, I have another question. What does dual variable mean? Mathematically, when we say Lambda is the dual variable of one F, what does it mean? Mathematically. It means that when you solve the dual problem to this linear optimization problem, then you take the dual variable associated with that constraint and take its value. Um, yes, yeah. I, I technically, completely... there's a whole Wikipedia article behind the theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. But, but before that, if we give an interpretation, mathematical interpretation for lambda, what should it be? What does it show? Hello. Uh... It can yep. show the sensitivity of the OTP function to the specific variable. Very good, very good, very good. Thank you, thank you so much. Every dual variable, for example, here lambda for one f, it shows the sensitivity of the objective function with respect to any small perturbation in the corresponding constraint, right? At the optimal point. So for example, if you increase demand or change the generation, or, yeah, if you change the demand a little, 0 0.0001, you have to check how much the objective function is changing. You can drive the right-hand side and left-hand side sensitivity. If they are both equal, it means that you have a unique tool variable. But if the left and right hand side sensitivities are different, it means that you have uh, a multiple, multiple values for dual variable, right? So you can increase the demand, then you can decrease the demand, and then you can check the sensitivity of objective function with those changes in both right and left hand sides. Yes, Lina, very good. Peter, yeah, we have a lot of 
correct answers. Thank you so much. Yes, so we, we, we uh, learned that dual variable shows the sensitivity of objective function with respect to that constraint, any perturbation in that in the corresponding constraint at the optimal point. Very good. Um, I have another question. Here, as I said, we can check right and left-hand side sensitivities. If they are different, it means that we have price multiplicity. But if you solve in this problem in GAMS or Python or, or Julia, how many prices it will give to you? Yeah, one, yes, yes. So that's the tricky part when you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be one, it will randomly uh, uh, get one price and, and give it to you. So whenever you solve your problem in GAMS, in Python, in Julia or whatever, uh, it will randomly pick one price and it will give it to you. It could be two, I mean, if the price is between 12 and 40, it may give to you 40, it may give to you 12, it gave you, I don't know, 17. So it will be a random choice. So always you need to have an analytical interpretation and to understand, oh, oh my God, I have more than one price. Yeah. Uh, very good. Let me ask another question. Let's say we have minimized f of x over x subject to h of x is equal to zero and g of x is lower than or equal to zero. The dual variable of equality constraint is lambda. The dual variable of inequality constraint is mu. Can we say anything about the sign of lambda? Lambda, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it zero? Yes. The, the sign of lambda is free. It could be positive, it could be negative, it could be zero. What about mu? Uh, I, I receive responses saying positive. Okay, let's, let's correct it. It's not 100% correct. Non-negative, exactly. Mu is always non-negative. It can be zero, it can take zero value. When does it take zero? When mu, if mu takes uh, zero, what does it mean? If we solve this problem and we see that, oh, the optimal value of mu is zero, what does it mean? It says that this constraint is non-binding. If mu value is zero, it means that this constraint is not binding. But if it takes value, it means that it affects the optimal solution. It's binding. Very good. Good, we will talk more about this in the next session. Let me check the time. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Good, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, so we learn about dual variable. We also call it Lagrangian multiplier. I, I used to call it dual variable. Also, you can call it a shadow variable. Uh, we have a question here. Why is utility function of demand defined as negative constant of demands? I'm not sure what you mean, Kai. It's, this part is not negative. It's the value of electricity for demands. So every single demand, every, sing, every one megawatt power has a value of 40 for demand D1 and the same for demand D2. So I, I'm not sure I got your question, Kai. Hope I answered. Okay, let me continue. If, if I didn't answer your question, you can write it again. Yeah, so remember uh, the dual variable gives you, the dual variable of balancing constraint gives you the price if we go for uniform pricing which is the most common uh, uh, clearing practice in real world electricity markets. Um, for example, uh, yeah, in, in US, in Europe, the day head markets are, are being cleared using uniform pricing. 
The other uh, potential pricing schemes, one is pay as bid. Are we using pay as bid pricing scheme in, in practice? Do you know any example about electricity markets? In pay as bid, everyone is paid or pays based on what they bid or offered. Exactly. Yeah. In uh, the balancing markets in, in Europe, not in all countries, uh, I think right now in Germany, uh, also in Denmark. Uh, yeah. yeah in, in Germany, I'm pretty sure they're using pay as bid. Also in intraday markets, um, we are using a continuous uh, version of balancing market, which are using pay as bid scheme. Very good, very good, very good. Also, we have another maybe uh, less known uh, pricing scheme called McCree Clark Group VCG. I'll talk about it in uh, yeah in two days. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, yeah. So this is our optimization problem. So lambda is our dual variable which gives us the price. We talked about the mathematical interpretation of dual variable. Also, we talked about the signs. Ah, this question, can the electricity market? Okay, so Lambda is a dual variable of equality constraint. By design, it can be positive, it can be negative. So Lambda is a free variable. The question is that, can the electricity market price be negative? Okay, we have a lot of answers saying yes. Okay, thank you, but why? Under which conditions the market price can be negative? You can unmute if you like. Uh, okay, I have a lot of answers. Very good, very good. Yeah, the, the common answer is excess supply. That's, that's totally correct. Uh, subsidies, ramping constraints, all of them, yeah, they are correct. So because of unique commitment constraints, because of the excess of power, uh, also because of the subsidies, if wind producers, they offer at a negative price, like minus $2 because of the subsidies. Also sometimes because of the network constraints, we may get uh, negative prices. In the case of network, negative nodal prices. But yes, it's, it's possible to get uh, negative prices in reality. And it's amazing. The demand will consume uh, power and will be paid. Very good. Now we go for a compact form of market clearing as an optimization problem. Um, please check uh, this optimization for a, for a minute then uh, try to explain what it is, how to interpret this optimization problem in a compact form. Now we don't have a two demands. We have uh, you know, uh, multiple demands, for example. So to try to interpret for yourself what this optimization means. Is there someone who would like to explain this optimization problem? You are welcome to unmute. Okay, I'll, I'll explain myself. Hello? Yes, please. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Achilles, please. Uh, so it's uh, essentially the same problem as before, but uh, for uh, an arbitrary set of generators and, uh, and an arbitrary set of uh, demands. Yes. So we have multiple demands, yeah, yeah, and, and generators, okay. So let's start with objective function, Achilles. What's the first term? Uh, so, yeah, it's the sum of the utility over all the demands. Yes. 
So for all demands D, UD, is it parameter or variable? Uh, UD is a parameter. Yes, the, because it's not bids. here. It's not listed here. It's the bid price of the demands or utility price of the demands. Yes, so it's a parameter. What about PD? Uh, PD is, uh, these are uh, decision variables to yes. be found from the optimization. It's a variable, exactly. So what about the second term, Achilles? Uh, in a similar way, the cost for every generator, CG, is the it's a parameter. The parameter. And again, in a similar way, PG is the it's a right. variable to be found. Very good. Very good. Can you also explain uh, constraints? What about the first one? Uh, so one B is the the set of all the uh, operational limits for the demands. Yeah. So it's, uh, what does this side mean? For for each uh, demand. For each uh, demand. D. So for each demand D. If we have ten demands, how many constraints like one B we have? Uh, 10. Yes, if we have 10 demands, we have 10 constraints like 1B. So it's one constraint per demand. Yeah, so this is the, the demand consumption is non-negative and lower than or equal to maximum demand. What about 1C? Uh, again, it's uh, the operational limits for each uh, generator in the yes. set uh, G. Exactly, and 1D? 1D is a, a single constraint again. Yes. For the total uh, demand supply equilibrium. Very good. Uh, Akilas, how many constraints I, I, I have? Let's use the cardinality function. Uh, for example, if we have D, it means that the number of demands. So how many constraints do we have? So the cardinality, yeah, it's uh, D plus G plus uh, one for the constraints. Exactly, let me write, it. exactly. This is the number of constraints. Number of constraints, very good. What about the number of variables? Uh, number of variables are- uh, Check here. Uh, D plus uh, G. Exactly, thank you so much. Good, good, very good. How many dual variables do we have? as uh, many as constraints. Exactly, exactly. Very good, thank you so much, Achilles. You helped thank me you. a lot, thanks a lot. <laughs> Do you have any question to Achilles? Mm, the number of constraints. Yes. Uh, shouldn't it be two times that? Because we have a great uh, zero good, and thank more you. than PD. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, Achilles, we made a mistake. Here, each constraint is, we have upper constraint and lower constraint for 1B and 1C. So it's 2D times 2G plus one. Thank you so much for the correction. Thank you. Good, let me continue because the time is running. Uh, yeah, um, maybe we can, we can have a break for 15 minutes. And then um, we will start again at sharply at 5 p.m. Denmark time. Uh, so I hold recording, but I, I leave uh, the Zoom link open. See you in 15 minutes. Okay, um, let me continue uh, with, with the lecture. Um, but before uh, continuing, uh, there were some questions in the chat box that I answered there, but also I would like to mention them uh, during the course and to be recorded. Uh, one question was about the definition of social welfare. The question was, can we define social welfare as the revenue or the, yeah, the, the, the revenue of demands and, and revenue of generators? The, question, the answer is, is no. Uh, we should not consider the revenue of, of generators and demands in the social welfare definitions. It's based on their offer and bid prices. Uh, actually, we cannot put the revenue there because the revenue is based on price and the price is the outcome of the optimization problem. 
The other question was that, uh, is it, does it make sense for generators to offer at a price different than their true prices, lower than or higher than their true prices? Uh, yes, uh, we call it strategic bidding or strategic offering. And we will talk about it later in the course when uh, we will talk about bi-level programming. Yes, definitely uh, in, in uniform pricing, it makes sense for generators to exercise market power, market power by bidding strategically. Uh, there was other question about negative pricing, how uh, ex extra or ex uh, excess of supply uh, can, can uh, lead to a negative price. Uh, maybe I need to uh, a, a bit elaborate on it. Uh, in my understanding, when uh, if there is a power plant, inflexible power plant that needs to produce and we cannot make the production zero, then uh, the demands might be encouraged to consume extra, but at the cost of negative price. For example, assume a nuclear power plant that we cannot uh, suddenly shut it down then uh, the demands might be encouraged to consume more, but at a negative price. Otherwise, if the generators, they can uh, make their production level zero, I don't see any reason why uh, the price, uh, the market price could be negative. Uh, yes, I don't see... Uh, one asks, why do not minimizing the generation cost instead of welfare function to, to avoid multiple prices? Well, uh, the social welfare means the welfare of all market participants. We cannot just focus on generators and not consider the demands if they are elastic to price. The social welfare means the, the welfare of the whole of all market participants. Um, so it doesn't make sense uh, to, to just consider. It means that then we have some market operators, but we are clearing the market in favor of a part of market participants. It, it doesn't make sense economically. Uh, yeah, there, can I ask further on my question about negative prices? Uh, yeah, well, I, I need to continue the lecture. Uh, maybe we can uh, continue the, the the questions and answering them tomorrow in the first uh, session in in the exercise session. Uh, otherwise, I'll not be able to to finish the lecture. But thank you so much for being active. Thank thanks a lot. Let me continue. Uh, well, market clearing now with with transmission network. So again, uh, our previous example with two generators, two demands, but uh, within a network, we have three transmission lines and three buses, right? So assume that the capacity of each line is 100 megawatt and the susceptance of each uh, if transmission line is 500 Siemens. It's the reverse of O. So assume we have this uh, system with the same technical, uh, uh, technical parameters for generators and demands. Um, I think most of you know how we can model power flow uh, in, in, in power systems. Um, in reality, uh, we can define the power flow using AC uh, power flow equations, power flow equations, alternative uh, current power flow equations. But what is the problem with AC OPF or AC power flow? There, there is a problem with AC power flow equations when we put them in optimization problem, yes. They define non-convexities in our optimization problem. So AC OPF in general, uh, by design, it's non-linear and non-convex. We can make them convex in different ways. Um, either by relaxation or by approximation. Well, I'll not go uh, in detail of that, but a common practice to make them convex is a uh, well-known uh, approximation called DC uh, power flow or linearized lossless power flow. 
Uh, I suppose you already know how to do that. We need to consider some assumptions. We need to ignore power losses. We ignore. Uh, we need to ignore resistance. We need to ignore uh, reactive power flow. And at the end of the day, after all those assumptions, we end up to this equation for power flow between two buses, bus N and M. It's equal to the susceptance uh, of, of that line, the line connecting buses N and M, which is parameter times the difference of voltage angles, theta N minus theta M, theta N and theta M, both are variables. And this equation is linear and it's convex. So uh, I already answered the first question. In reality, the power flow occasions, they are based on AC power flow occasions. They are nonlinear and non-convex. Uh, and why do we use the DC power flow occasion? To make the problem convex or to keep the, the market clearing problem convex. Uh, well, um, if you are interested in other DTU courses, uh, there is a very nice course uh, teaching by my colleague Spiros. And uh, if you like to learn more about the optimal power flow, power flow, optimal power flow in both AC and DC, and also uh, the more advanced relaxation of AC optimal flow um, in uh, resulting in semi-definite programming, you can, you can take this course. Uh, also, this is a very nice book with my friend, uh, Josh, uh, from University of Toronto. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, a book with 100 pages, something like that. And he explained very well in this book, the different variants of uh, power flow and optimal power flow in both transmission and distribution systems. Anyway, uh, power flow is not, uh, the, the content of this course. Um, so for the previous problem with two demands, two generators and three uh, transmission lines, this is our market clearing problem. Could you please check it out for a minute and interpret what it means? And maybe after one minute, one of you can uh, nominate yourself and explain this optimization problem. Is there anyone who would like to explain this formulation? Um, I'm up, hello. Hello, could you please introduce yourself? Um, I'm Mario. Uh, Mario, yep. yeah. Yeah, so- I'll help you with uh, writing the screen. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, so again, we have our um, same objective function, I believe, with our demand on the left side, uh, the positive term, and then our generation on the um, right-hand side, the negative term. So Mario, does network, adding network, change the, the objective function? Mm, nope. Yeah, thank you. What about the list of variables? Uh, uh, it does increase, increase it. Yeah. So how does it change? Uh, we have to add um, one for each uh, transmission line, I believe. No, not per transmission line. It's oh, no, per uh, no. Yeah. Per one, node, per yeah. note, one per note. So if we have 10 buses, but five lines, how many voltage angles do we have? Uh, one per bus. So one ten. per bus, exactly, yeah. exactly. So when we add network in DC market clearing based mm -hmm. on DC power flow, we need to add one voltage angle variable per, per bus. Good, yeah, could you please continue? Yeah, then we have again our um, capacity limits for the generator and the generators and loads. Uh, exactly. So we, we had them already. 
Yeah. yeah. And then uh, what about this three? Yeah, those have to be the um, in each uh, voltage. Uh, sorry, in each uh, bus, we have to have a power balance. So, so the power... can we call it nodal power balance yeah. constraints? Yes. Okay. Uh, could you please explain the first one, for example? Yeah. So here we have um, first term is the generation. Uh, yeah. So the power injected by generator one. Then we have our uh, power transmission from uh, yes. our node one. Let's uh, say yeah. this is node one. This is G one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Let I, I have to check um, our node. So G one and G two they are in bus and demands in yeah. Okay. Now I got. It. Okay. This is bus one. Bus two. G two is here. And also we have a demand D1, mm -hmm. and this is bus three, we have D2 here. Okay, yeah. So yeah, our first term is the power injection by generator one. Yes. Our second term negative is our uh, flow from bus one to bus two. Exactly. So this is the flow from, I call it F one to two. It means that the flow from bus one to bus two Mm -hmm. Right. So this flow, it's a uh, departing. Uh, it, it's going outside bus one. It's going from bus one to bus two. Is it like a generation or is it like a demand for bus one? Uh, I believe that's one three. I think there's a comment right now about that. Okay. And um, anyways, um, could you say the question again? Sorry. <laughs> ah, this is bus. Sorry. This is sorry. Yeah. Someone told me. Okay. Bus flow is here flow one to two. Yes. So this flow one to two is like a demand for bus one. It's a like a generation for bus two. So this is uh, why it's minus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is 500? Uh, this, was it the... So the dense of yeah. the line. So mm -hmm. theta n1 minus theta n2. So this term in total, it, it, it says f one of two, right? Mm -hmm. Flow from bus one to bus two. It's minus because it's like the demand mm -hmm. for, for bus one. What about this? It's the flow from bus one to bus three. Uh, same situation where we have this acceptance and the both uh, load angles. Very good. So um, so I said that F1, uh, one, two is a demand for one, but it's a generation for two. Mm -hmm. But in the second one, again, we have minus, why? Uh, it, uh, we have the signal, the sign um, of the okay. low flows, uh, sorry, of the voltage uh, yes. angle change. So yes, we can have it minus theta n2 minus theta n1 or mm -hmm. plus 500 times theta n1 minus theta n2. So, so f1 to 2 is equal to minus f to 2 1. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, there's a question, let me see. If we have equilibrium problem and the participant has to pay, okay, fire that that's uh, not a question for now. Uh, we will have it tomorrow, fire that that question. Okay, so we have uh, three power balance equalities, one per node. What about these three dual variables, Mario? It's, it's uh, that's the dual variable for each uh, node. And... Exactly. So we have nodal prices, right? Nodal prices. We also call it LMP, right? Do you know what does this stand for? I've done it, but I don't remember right now. <laughs> Locational marginal prices, right? Mm -hmm. They are nodal prices. Mario, are these mm -hmm. three prices, are they necessarily equal? Nope. Okay. Do you know when they can, be, they can take different values? Uh, when you have a certain uh, line saturated, I believe. Congested, okay. If we uh, have congestion yes. in one of the nodes, sorry, in one of the lines, these three uh, nodal prices, they might be different. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm not saying that all of them are different. Two of them might be the same, one might be different or, yeah. But under which conditions these three prices are equal? When there's no congestion and the Very market good. is clear. Uh, Very good. Uh, what about these three constraints, Mario? Those are the capacity of the lines, the yes. limit they pose. Okay, five, yeah, this is the power flow from bus mm -hmm. one to one two. Why we bound them from both sides, 100 and one mi minus 100? Uh, we can transfer power in both directions. Exactly, exactly. 
So because of since we can have uh, uh, both directions from one to two or from two to one, we need to impose both of them. What about the last one? Uh, we usually have a certain slack bus or reference bus, which we set to zero uh, voltage. Do you know and why mathematically we need this? Uh, to be able to solve it for the number of, um, actually, I, I'm not, yeah, to have the same number of uh, equations as uh, exactly. unknowns. Yeah. Right? Without, without this variable, we may have uh, multiplicity for all variables. What is important for us is the difference of the voltage angles, not the value of each of them. So to make sure that we will get a single value for each voltage angle, we can enforce one of them to be zero and then to obtain this. But even without them, still, though we may get different values for voltage angles, but the difference uh, is unchanged. So it's still uh, in terms of production and consumption, the results will be unchanged. But just to get a, a single, a unique solutions for thetas, we need to impose one of them to be equal to zero. For the unique solution, yes, Zeichan. Uh, Ze, uh, Ze, yeah, your, your question, your answer is totally correct. Mario, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so we explained this. Compact for. Uh, yeah, maybe someone else also can explain very rapidly market clearing with network as a compact form. Do we have a, a volunteer explaining this formulation? Someone else? So as you see, the objective function is the same as before. We have three types of variables. Uh, generation level of generators, consumption of demands, and voltage angles one per bus n. Uh, the demand consumption limits, generation production limits, power balance equality per bus, nodal power balance equalities. So uh, this shows that all demands which are located at bus n so we have one power balance constraint per bus. So all demands that are connected at bus N, all generators that are connected at bus N, and also here, uh, all, all the lines connected to bus N. So as you see here, this looks like a demand because it's a power flow going outside, going out of bus N, from bus N to us M. So it's positive, it's positive, and the demand is the injection, it's minus. So we have one dual variable per bus. So we have nodal market clearing prices. And then the same, this is the, uh, the, the uh, transmission line uh, capacities. So it's a flow from bus N to bus M and it's, uh, the, the upper bound is, is the, the capacity of the line and also the minus capacity of the line. We have to impose it if the direction is reverse. And at the end of the day, we also need to have a slack bus, uh, definition of the slack bus. Do we have a question here? Okay, can you help me to derive the number of variables and the number of constraints? One of you. Number of variables first. These are our variables, yeah? So that would be the number of generators plus the number of uh, demand sites. Yeah. Plus the number of nodes or buses. Thank, thank you so much. Yes, this is the number of variables. One per generator, one per demand, one per, one per node. Thank you so much. Number of constraints? So for each generator, there would be two constraints. Yeah, two the constraints. Maximum and minimum. Yeah, for 2G. Each plus yeah. 2D. Plus 2D from here. What about plus, the power balance constraints? There's one power balance constraint per node, so plus N. Yes. And then there are two constraints for each N and M 
Okay, so, so I case, call it uh, L. L, number of lines. the number of lines. So this is the number of lines and two of them, as you said. What about the last one? There is only one reference angle, so one exactly. constraint. Exactly, so this is the number of constraints. So in your problem, uh, in your course project, this number should be at least 1,000 or this number should be at least 1,000. Um, very good, thank you, thank you. Let's continue. So as I said, this is all demands at bus N, uh, all buses M connected to bus N, uh, then uh, all generators located at bus N, nodal prices, capacity of line, uh, transmission lines and voltage angle at the reference bus. So we already talked about that. Okay, uh, here uh, I provided a GAMS code for, for the problem we discussed. Also, I uploaded this GAMS code uh, on DTU Insight portal. If you are using GAMS, you can check it out. If you are using Julia or Python or MATLAB or whatever, you need to write your own code. Uh, I'll not go deep in this code. I think it's simple. If you, you already use uh, uh, GAMS, it should be very easy for you to understand how this code works. The first exercise for tomorrow, the first session is that um, in our example, all the, the capacity of all transmission lines is 100. So for one of the uh, lines connecting bus one to, uh, to three, reduce, uh, the, the capacity from 100 to 40 and run the code and compare the market clearing outcomes, means productions, consumptions, and prices, and try to interpret the new outcomes with the new uh, uh, capacity constraint. Yeah, the, the, the new, uh, the value for, for the capacity constraint, which is 40 megawatt. That's something that we will talk tomorrow uh, first. Uh, so this is the problem we talked about. It's our market clearing problem. I call it primal optimization. And uh, yeah, it's exactly the same. Just the only thing is that I defined one dual variable per constraint. And for the non-negativity constraints, I, I impose them under the maximization operator we will talk later, you can put them in your constraints or you can put them there. I'll explain why. But yeah, that's the only change here. So I'll call it primal optimization problem for market clearing. And as I said, this is LMPs, the nodal prices. Any questions so far? Yes, yes, yes. Ahmed asked, can we use this problem for your project? Yes, of course. Yep, definitely. Good. I did not get the difference in this new case. Ah, uh, okay. Here, in our previous problem, we have three buses and the capacity of each line is 100 megawatt. Right? So here in this exercise, I asked you to, rip to, to change the capacity of line from 100 to 40, and then run the market, clear the market and see how it changed. Is it clear, Jan? Good. Good. Dual problem. If you, uh, take, if you drive the dual optimization of this problem, it will be this. Uh, it may look a bit scary in the first glance. So now I will start explaining how to take a dual optimization of a problem, but it's your exercise tomorrow to understand how this dual problem, dual optimization, we, how, how can we achieve it? So you have the answer, but uh, by, by tomorrow, you need to think how, 
how to get this dual optimization problem from this primal optimization problem. But how to achieve it, it's what I will explain in the next 20 minutes. Okay, so this is your exercise for tomorrow. So in the tomorrow first session, we will talk about this dual problem, how to achieve it. If you can derive it yourself and I don't know, prepare some papers or whatever and teach us tomorrow in the exercise session, I'll be very grateful. Okay. So how to derive a dual optimization, that's what uh, I'm gonna teach now. And exercise three, yeah, think about your project. You can start step one of your course project. So it's something that you can start thinking. So it's not a really exercise. You can just, it's a reminding that you can start thinking of step one of your course project. So for tomorrow, we have two exercises, right? Good. That's what uh, I gonna teach for the next 20 minutes. I don't know how many of you already took a convex optimization course, but I like to explain you how we can drive KKTs, how can we drive dual optimization, just to make sure that all of us, we are in the same page. In the rest of this uh, course, we will use duality, uh, KKT is a lot. So it's very important that um, we make sure all of you, you know how to drive dual optimization. Uh, no, Mario, I, I don't have any specific recommendation for Python library. Um, I don't have any recommendation for the programming uh, softwares. You can use whatever you like. Okay. Yeah, Payomo, of course, you can use Payomo. That's... Uh, 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 yeah. Okay, so how many of you, uh, you, you know how to take dual problem and how to take KKTs? Just I like to get an idea how many of you knows about this optimization concepts? Just you can write yes in the chat box for me to get an idea how many of you knows. Okay, I'm getting a lot of yes in the chat box, which is a good sign. Okay. Very good, very good. Okay, so let me explain about uh, the basics of convex optimization, uh, just to make sure that we are on the same page. Uh, two important uh, uh, references, convex optimization of uh, Stephen Boyd and Leon Vanderberg uh, from Stanford. Uh, it's, it's a very important book not with the flavor of power systems. It's a pure optimization book. Um, I really recommend you to take a convex optimization course if you haven't done it before. Also, uh, this new book uh, written by my colleagues, Ramtin Sushansi and Antonio Conejo. Uh, again, it's a very nice book with engineering flavor. So you can also learn about convexity, convex optimization, duality theory, KKT is all there. So also it's a very, I, I recommend this book. Do you know this person? Yeah. Yes, he's uh, Stefan Boyd. Uh, yeah, one of the pioneers in uh, optimization theory. Uh, he's the first author of this book. He visited DTU uh, three years ago or two years ago, more than two years ago. And he said, it's in the link, DTU should teach a course on convex optimization and all the students should be obliged to take, to, to take it. And well, uh, I think it's a really good recommendation. So if you haven't uh, taken convex optimization course, please, please do that. Uh, at DTU, if you like to take a uh, a course about convex optimization. Uh, there is a three week course by my friend, uh, Martin Anderson. It's a three week course in uh, every June. Yes. Yeah, also uh, Stefan Boyd uh, course is available on YouTube. Uh, yes, and all the codes uh, on, on CVEX and MATLAB. 
you can also watch uh, Boyd's, uh, the seven Boyd's videos on, on YouTube. Good, okay. I have 20 minutes to teach uh, convex optimization. Let's see what we can do. Uh, just uh, let me warn that I, I may exit uh, with five minutes to 10 minutes. So we may finish this lecture 10 minutes later than what we scheduled. So my apologies for that. Um, how to drive the Lagrangian function. So assume that we have a generic optimization problem like this. This is the standard or canonical form of optimization. It's minimization and all inequalities, they are in form of lower than or equal to, okay? So for your convenience, whenever you have any optimization, first of all, convert it to this form. If it's maximization, just write it minimization of minus of your objective function, then it will be minimization, right? So if you make it minus f of x, it will be maximization. And also, you know, if it's greater than or equal to, just you need to, to, to sign, to, to, uh, to multiply both sides by a minus, then you can flip the sign. So later, this is, uh, from now on, this is the canonical or standard form of our optimizations, okay? So the question is that uh, the first things to get the KKDs and to get the dual problem, the first thing, the first step is to derive the Lagrangian function. Do you know how to derive the Lagrangian function? Let me write it. We will show the Lagrangian function with this symbol. It's a function of what? Can you help me? It's a function of just X or just lambda and mu or all of them? What's the answer? All of them. Lagrangian function is a function of all primal and dual variables. Okay. It's equal to our objective function, f of x. Again, I'm uh, emphasizing its minimization and all the inequalities, they are in the form of lower than or equal to plus lambda times h of x. If instead of zero, we have, for example, five, it will be h of x minus five. But we don't have five here, it's zero. So it's lambda h of x. Since we have more than one equality constraints, so then lambda, let's say that it's a vector, then we need lambda transpose. If we have more than one equality constraint, if lambda is a vector. And in the same way, we have mu times j of x. If we have more than one inequality constraint, we need mu transpose, if mu is a vector. Again, here is a zero. If it's, for example, six, then we write g of x minus six. But we don't have it here. Okay. So this is the Lagrangian fu function. Okay. Yeah, as, as it's written here. So this is our original problem and this is our Lagrangian function. Is there any question so far? Sunset, it's clear. Good. Now we write, we, we need to get uh, KKT conditions. Karish Cohen Tucker kid, Karish Cohen Tucker conditions. They are optimality conditions. We like to solve this problem by hand manually. So we drive the Lagrangian function. From here, we like to get a system of equations, a set of equations, okay? How can we do that? The KKTs, Karish Cohen Tucker conditions, it's a set of equations, equality and inequality constraints. The first one is the derivative of our Lagrangian function 
with respect to every single primal variable. It should be equal to zero. Okay? So if you have five primal variables, you need to have five uh, equality constraints achieving by taking the derivative of Lagrangian function with, which, with respect to each primal variable. Then uh, you have your original uh, equality constraints. So h of x is equal to zero. You have your inequality constraint. g of x is lower than or equal to zero. We already talked about the sign of mu, which could be mu is always non-negative, while lambda is free. The last constraint that we call it complementarity slackness, it says that g of x times mu is equal to zero. It's, it's a nonlinear, it's a product of two variables, product of a primal variable or, or, or a function of primal variable and dual variable, and it's nonlinear. What does this constraint mean? Any, any answer? It means that either mu is equal to zero or g of x is equal to zero or both of them are equal to zero. It's common to write these three constraints in a compact way as g of x is less than or equal to zero mu is non-negative, and this sign. It's a complementarity sign. This sign, let me write it in a better way. This sign says that g of x times mu is equal to zero. We call it complementarity slackness condition. Or we can write it just to have a symmetric condition, just to make it beautiful. We can write it minus g of x, is greater than or equal to zero, and its product with mu is equal to zero, and mu is non negative. Okay? So these are our KKT conditions. So one condition, two, three, and four. We need to solve all those four problems, system of equations together, to be able to solve this optimization problem. When do you recommend to use KKTs? And when do you recommend to use primal dual reference formation? Uh, Brian, I'll, I'll talk about it later in bilevel programming. So let me answer it, not now. Virginia, why did you say that the Lagrangian has both primal and dual variables? No, I said the Lagrangian function is a function of primal variables and dual variables. This is what I said. What are the dual variables? Yeah, I explained every constraint, for every constraint, we need to define a dual variable. Dual variable shows the sensitivity of objective function with respect to any perturbation in that constraint at the optimal point. Now, lambda and mu are variables. They are dual variables, not primal variables, dual variables. They are not parameters. They are variables, but dual variables. Okay. Any other question? So X is our only primal variable, Y, lambda, and mu, they are our dual variables. Good. So this is our KKT conditions. As I said, the derivative of Lagrangian function with respect to each primal variable should be equal to zero. Our inequality constraint, uh, the non-negativity of dual variable of inequality constraints, our inequality constraint, and the fact that their product should be equal to zero, and the dual variable of equality constraint is free. Well, you can, I mean, it doesn't give you any, I mean, much information, the last constraint. You, you can ignore writing it in your KKT conditions. 
If it's not written, it means that lambda is free. Any question? Good, let me continue. Yeah, as I call, this is complementarity slackness condition. Let me give you an example. Maybe it, it helps you uh, to better understand. We have a minimization problem. So it's in the form of standard form. So it's fine. Uh, four variables, x1 to x4. So we have four variables, our objective function, and uh, six, six constraints. So we define one, one dual variable per, per constraint. So remember to not list dual variables under the minimization operator. Here, just list your primary variables. Good. Is it in the standard form? Is this optimization in the form of, in, in, in the canonical form? No, because we have greater than or equal to. We have to make it lower than or equal to, exactly. So yeah, remember this. So you can easily write it. This is, for example, all, so for all of them, for example, this one is minus x1 is lower than or equal to zero. And still I call it mu three. So if we drive the Lagrangian function of this problem, uh, I call all mu's as mu, a vector of mu. So mu vector mu includes six mu one to mu six, mu one, mu two to, till mu six, and vector x includes uh, x one to x four. So it's Lagrangian function as a function of primal and dual variables. So our objective function, it's duplicated here. It's in the minimization form, so it's fine. So here, remember, uh, it should be in the form of lower than or equal to. So it's why I put here minus. So minus mu one. So I put one in the uh, left-hand side. So it's two third x one plus two x two plus x three minus one, right? So it, this minus comes from the fact that the sign should be flipped. The same for this constraint, we write this one. So for the three uh, non-negativity or non-positivity non -positivity conditions, also we write this, this terms. Uh, specifically for mu four, it's, we already have minus. So it's x two lower than or equal to zero. So here it comes with the positive sign. Is it clear? have to drive the Lagrangian function of this example here. Hope it's clear. Yeah, this is our Lagrangian function. I repeat it here. So for the KKTs, we need to take four derivatives, one per primal variable we have four primal variables, x1, x2, x3, and x4. So we take the derivatives. For example, with respect to x1, it's 18 minus two third mu one, minus mu two, minus mu three is equal to zero. Or for x2, it's plus eight, minus two mu one, minus mu two, plus mu four is equal to zero, okay? And so on. We don't have any equality condition. So we don't have equality conditions to be included here, but we have six inequality conditions. So for each inequality conditions, for example, we had x four, is not negative, right? So x4, its dual variable is mu six. Of course, you can write it in the form of minus x4 lower than or equal to zero, but we don't, I mean, x4 times mu is equal to zero is the same as minus x4 mu is equal to zero. So this sign minus doesn't, I mean, it doesn't change. 
So here we have this complementarity condition for X4 non-negativity. So for each inequality condition, we need to write one complementarity condition. Remember again, each complementarity condition includes three types of constraints. For example, here, minus X2 is non-negative, mu4 is non-negative, and the product of minus X2 mu4 is equal to zero. Okay. Anyway, this is your KKT conditions. And to solve your optimization problem by hand, you need to derive this and solve it as a system of equations. But remember, it's a nonlinear problem. It's not a linear problem. So it's not that easy or that straightforward to solve it by hand. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll try to finish in 10 minutes. So sorry for extending uh, the, the duration of the course. Good, so this is our KKT conditions. But there's a question, can we write our KKT conditions in a more compact way? Let me explain, yes. For example, check these two constraints. Here, remember mu three, let me back here. Mu three and till mu six, they are corresponding to non-negativity conditions of variables. Mu one and mu two, they are related to, I don't know, uh, regular constraints, but mu three, mu four, mu five, mu six, they are corresponding to non-negativity constraints. Only one variable appears there. So let's check for example, for mu three. Here, you can define the value of mu three so here mu three is equal to 18 minus two third mu one minus mu two, mu two, right? And you can replace mu three here, right? So this way you can get rid of mu three. So, so here we can get rid of mu three and just write X one uh, complementarity conditions, 18 minus two third mu one minus mu two is non-negative, x one is non-negative. So instead of these two equations, we can write this one. So this way we can get rid of mu three. So it's up to you how to write KKT conditions. You can also write in a more compact way like this while here you have only mu one and mu two, you got rid of mu three to mu six. So this is why we recommend this because we have less number of dual variables. But if you use the other one, it's not wrong. Just you are introducing extra unnecessary dual variables. Um, if you write a few, yes, uh, I'll be happy that everything is clear. Is everything clear? Are you following? Oh, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, good, 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 good. Thank you so much. Good. I have a question now for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I have a question. Okay, we realize that solving this problem by hand is hard. It's a system of equations, right? How can we solve it? It's a part of your, your project, step one of your project. How can we solve this problem? It's a system of equations. System of equations. How can we solve it uh, by, by GAMS, by Python, by Julia, whatever. Brian said using path. Thank you so much. Yes, in GAMS and also I think in Julia, I'm not sure we have it in Python. We have a solver called PASS. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's developed in University of Wisconsin like 20 years ago, I guess. And, and uh, you, can, you can define, you can uh, use path solver to solve this one. So if we solve it, we call it, we call this problem, 
Yeah, Farzad mentioned it. Thank you so much. We call this problem mixed complementarity program because we have a complementarity conditions here and in abbreviation MCP. This is a MCP problem. Uh, MCP is a system of equations. There is no objective function. So you can use path solver and so on. Yeah, Milat mentioned another way. Well, uh, yeah, we'll talk about it later using big M. Let's not use it right now. Any other? Uh, someone mentioned NLP solver. Yeah, Eric, uh, also Brian. Uh, Brian, NL, I agree. This is an NLP constraint, I agree. But we don't have any objective function. How can we solve this using a, a nonlinear solver? Maybe Eric or, or Brian. Yeah, you, yeah. you can just, uh, in GAMS, you can just formulate an objective function, like let's say a constant objective function and just call a IPO, for example. Minimize what? Like, a, I would say a constant, like yeah. two. Minimize one. One, yeah. Yeah, it's an auxiliary nonsense objective function, but it's fine. What are the variables then? X1, X2, X2 to X4, and mu1 and mu2. Yeah. Yes, you can solve it also using a nonlinear solver. So an auxiliary trivial objective function constrained by a set of nonlinear constraints. And you have six variables. Very good. So you can either use by pass or you can solve, uh, yeah, as I said, by NLP solvers. Also, there's other way to, to transform NLP problem to mixed integer linear program for this MCP problems but I'm not gonna teach it now. I'll, I'll talk it later in the rest of the course when we talk about bi-level programming. Good. Okay, we have, uh, yeah, seven minutes for dual problem. How to drive dual problem. That's your second exercise. Uh, why is it appealing to drive dual problem? Um, my answer is that because it provides you a lower bound. Yes. Yes, Ahmed said to find a lower bound. Good, let's, let's see how it works. You remember your Lagrangian function, right? This is again our canonical standard form of our optimization. And this is our Lagrangian function, right? To drive the dual problem, remember primal and dual problem, they are like uh, two, two sisters. Um, if you solve them, you will get the same solution, right? Every primal problem has a corresponding dual problem. So under some conditions, we will call it a Slater condition. So, so let me reward under some conditions the solution of primal and dual problem are always the same, okay? And for linear problems, always it holds. So to be able to drive a dual problem, first we need to drive dual function. And the dual function is this, Lagrangian of X, Lambda and Mu, this is our Lagrangian function. We need to minimize it over x, we call it Lagrange, sorry, dual function. That's the first way. So if we solve this, the dual function, it's a function of what? X or lambda or mu or all of them or a part of it. Here you are minimizing Lagrangian function with respect to S. So our outcome will be a function of only duals, lambda and mu, exactly. Good, thank you. So that's a dual function. And why do we like dual function? Um, 
There are some explanation here and a link for a video that I found that interesting. You can read it later. But if, for example, this is our uh, convex problem, trying to minimize and find the minimum problem, for the arbitrarily values of lambda and mu, I'm not saying optimal values of mu and lambda, for arbitrarily values of mu and lambda, always the dual function provides a lower bound for our original problem. And in the optimal point, if lambda and mu are optimal, we will see that the corresponding dual problem, which is concave, I mean, we have exactly, I mean, the maximization, the maximum point of concave dual problem is exactly the same as uh, the, the minimum point of the original convex problem. But it happens if the values of lambda and mu for dual function are optimal. Otherwise, for arbitrarily values of lambda and mu, if you arbitrarily give values for lambda and mu, but they should be feasible, your dual function should be something like this. It's a lower bound. It provides a lower bound for your optimal point. Okay, but how to take the dual, the dual problem? Remember, this is your dual function. Now you need to, yeah, remember, this is your convex problem. This is your dual problem. Now you need to maximize this point to minimize this duality gap. So you are pushing, you are pushing your convex problem up by maximizing it. So now we have a kind of maximum problem. It's a bi-level problem. So we are maximizing over, and over lambda and mu. Remember lambda comes from equality condition. So it's free inside while mu is always non-negative. So to drive the dual problem, you need to develop a max mean problem of your Lagrangian function. Is it clear? Okay, good. A very, in two minutes, I like to give you an example. Remember, we had this example. This is the Lagrangian function. So our dual problem is minimizing our Lagrangian function with respect to primal variables. In the inner optimization problem, I will call this inner optimization problem. And our outer optimization problem is to maximize the same objective function, but uh, with respect to only dual variables. If you drive, if you solve this problem, you will get a dual optimization problem. Okay? Good. How can we solve this problem? Which problem we should we first should we solve first? Inner problem or outer problem? Inner. First, we need to get rid of this minimization. So we need to get rid of this minimization, and what we have will only will be maximized as a function of just with variables only dual variables of something. How can we get rid of this minimization? Very good, Milad. We need to replace, we need to replace the minimization problem with its KKTs. If we, if we replace the inner problem by KKTs, then we will have only maximized something without this minimization. Milad, uh, if we drive the KKTs of the inner problem, will we have complementarity conditions here? Look at the problem again. If we drive the KKTs of this problem, will we have uh, complementarity conditions like this? Do we have, yes, exactly. This is 
unconstrained problem. There is no constraint in the inner problem. There is only objective function. Just when we derive the KKTs, it's just the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to variables. Good. Okay, so we already derived the KKTs of this, right? You remember? So, ah, but one question. Here in the inner problem, here in the inner problem, we have uh, minus one times minus mu one, minus one times minus mu two. And they are not a function while we are minimizing only over x one to x four. So in the inner problem, they are constant. So should I eliminate minus one here? No, Farzad is saying no. It's a constant. Why I'm not eliminating two minus ones from the objective function? Yes, because we have plus minus, I mean, this and this gives plus minus, sorry, plus mu one. Though it's not a variable of inner optimization, but there are variables of outer optimization problems. So, so we should keep it. So what we have as a constant here, if you agree, is plus mu one, plus mu two. Do you agree? So we need to keep it as an objective function for the other problem. For the rest, we can derive the KKTs. So yeah, this is our problem. What happens? minus v1 time, so, so we have this objective function. To get rid of this minimization, we derive the KKTs. It's an unconstrained problem. So just the derivative of objective function with respect to x1, x2, x3, x4, which is our maximization problem. Is it clear? So now this problem is our dual problem. Is it clear? I can explain again if some of you ask. Good. So for our original problem, this is our dual variable, sorry, dual problem. It's the, the variables, as you see, the variables are only mu's. There is no X anymore in the dual optimization problem. Yes, exactly, Nicholas. Uh, this four terms, it gives us mu one plus mu two. Note that the objective function of the maximization problem is still all of them. Mu one and plus mu two, it's a constant for the inner problem, but it still is a part of objective function for maximization problem. The rest, we, uh, when we take the KKT of the inner problem, they go, they transfer to the constraints. So they will not be remained in the objective function. The rest, we transfer them to the constraints. But mu one plus mu two, they are still in the objective function. Nicholas, did I explain properly? So if you had no constants in the inner problem, yes. Exactly, yes, yes, yes. If you don't have any, any constant in, uh, in the primal problem, the objective function of dual problem will be simply zero, yes. So Peter, it's correct. It's what, what you are saying is correct, yes. But in market clearing problem, always we have demands, right? Always we have uh, installed capacity of generators. We have installed capacity of transmission lines. So always we have a non-zero uh, dual objective function. So can we write the dual problem in a more compact way? The answer is yes. How can we do that? Let me explain. This is what we derived right? 
six dual variables, all constraints are equality constraints. But if you check our objective function only includes mu one and mu two, mu three, mu four, mu five, mu six, they only appear in their own constraints. If you remember mu three to mu six, they are coming from non-negativity conditions of the variables. So we are not very interested in the optimal value of mu three, mu four, mu five, mu six. We can safely eliminate them. We know that mu three takes a positive value. So if we remove it, just we can write greater than or equal to zero. We are not interested in the value of mu three. We can safely eliminate it because mu three uh, does not appear anywhere else. It's just in this constraint. It's like a slack variable. And the same for others. So if you like to get a dual variable with a less number of variables, you can do that. Now only mu one and mu two, they are coming from regular constraints, not from non-negativity conditions. But now your constraints are inequality. They are not equality anymore. So this is also an easier way or more elegant way to write a dual problem with less number of dual variables. Is it clear? Good. Yeah, this is what I explained. So option one, this is your primal problem. You write all your non-negativity conditions as constraints. So you have dual problem with six dual variables or in a more elegant way, just write your two constraints, put the inequality, sorry, non-negativity conditions here and derive a dual problem with only two dual variables. I prefer this. Uh, yeah, sorry for, for a long uh, course, long lecture, rapidly. Number of primal variable, number of variables in the primal problem is equal to number of constraints in dual problem. Number of constraints in, in primal problem is equal to number of variables in dual problem. If you take dual of your dual problem, you will get your original primal problem. And dual variables of your dual problem are your primal variables. It means that here, yeah. That's it. Let me finish very rapidly. We have something called Vic duality theory. It says that at any feasible point of x1 to x4 and mu1 and mu4, sorry, mu2, the value of primal objective function is greater than or equal to the value of dual objective function. I'm talking about any feasible point. I'm not talking about optimal point. Uh, Akilas, so the general workflow is a standard for, yes, yes, Akilas, thank you for um, summary. First, a standard form, then drive Lagrangian function, then write it max mean, then drive the KKT of inner problem, then you have your uh, dual problem. Very good, thank you. The last thing is a strong duality theorem in the optimal point. I'm not talking about any feasible point. In the optimal point, if some conditions called Slater condition holds, I will not explain it in detail, but for linear problems, we usually have it. It's something coming from constraint quali qualification um, topic, but usually we have it for linear problems. For market clearing problem, we, we usually have it. Under these conditions, note that this, uh, uh, superscript means that we are talking about optimal point. In the optimal point, the value of primal objective function and the value of dual objective function, they are the same. And we call this a strong duality theory. Yes, that's it. Just as I mentioned, 
for tomorrow, we need to, yeah. This is our market clearing problem. And this is its, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's dual uh, counterpart. So for tomorrow, you need to uh, think how this dual problem can be achieved. Good. Um, I see that I'm, uh, yeah, we, we, it's 611. So I'm sorry for that. So if you agree, we skip the questions for, and tomorrow in the exercise session, I can, I, I can answer any question that you have from this course. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of you, and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.